Funding for this program made possible by the Investor Protection Trust, the State of Alaska Division of Banking and Securities, and AARP Alaska. Today's program, we hear the story of one woman's personal journey and remarkable recovery. And today, she's on a mission to spread awareness of the importance of healthcare directives. Now, here's your host, Ann Seacrest. Hello, everyone, and welcome to AARP Alaska. Today, our guest is Julie Wrigley, attorney, mother, wife, Alaskan, and a survivor. Julie, thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks, Ann. As uh, in part of your introduction, you are an estate planning and business attorney practicing here in Alaska. You have an undergraduate degree in international studies from Portland State University and you received your JD from Willamette University College of Law, admitted to the bar in 1999. You are married, have three children, all teens. Yes, I do. Yes. <laughs> Your areas of focus include estate planning, wills, and probate, and avid skier. You have also climbed Mount Kilimanjaro, but you also wear another hat, one that was quite unexpected. Tell us your story. Thanks, Anne. Well, um, in 2013, uh, as most young active women do when something goes wrong in your body, you um, listen to the news and peruse the information available and you try to decide for yourself what changes you can make uh, to improve your health. So a quick body scan had me uh, removing gluten and um, dairy and anything I could think of to remove what I simply thought was a stomach ache. Um, and uh, that wasn't working. It wasn't working and I um, kept uh, thinking and reading and researching and finally I found myself at a routine doctor's appointment where I actually just uh, casually mentioned to my physician that um, all of these things I'd been doing to diagnose myself and she immediately perked up and said well that's that sounds kind of interesting I think um, those questions are probably better addressed by a GI doctor um, that's not why I was there to see her. Um, and so I, I brushed her off a little bit. I uh, left her that appointment not intending to follow up, in fact, um, because I was short on time. I had, like you mentioned, I have three children. I was working a very part-time job. Um, you know, mothers don't work part-time. Right. Um, <laughs> so I guess a part-time job in addition to um, my other jobs. Um, I, like you said, I'm an avid skier and I'm, I was uh, training for a half marathon at the time. Um, just very busy. So the last thing I wanted to do was go to another doctor's appointment for myself. Um, but when I think about it, I will admit that I've always said, if you aren't going to follow the directions of your doctor, you should find a new doctor because after all, you're paying them there to be there to, to get their opinion. So, so I did, I thought, well, okay, I'll, I'll call and make an appointment um, with a GI doctor, a gastroenterologist that she recommended. And um, he uh, got me in relatively soon at that point. Um, but when I made that appointment, it occurred to me that I had never asked my parents about their their history. Mm -hmm. um, something that I think maybe many of us do is um, not talk to our parents or our family members about what our family history really is. And for some reason, this particular time, maybe because I'd never seen a GI doctor before, I decided to call each of my parents who fortunately were still, are still alive um, and uh, ask them their personal histories. Um, my mom was great. She said, she has a very good memory and said absolutely there was she didn't know of anything so that was great check for me on that one um, when I talked to my dad he mentioned that um, that well nothing concerning over the years but he would he did tell me that he 
he'd had some polyps removed from his colon over the years, and there was never any, anything to worry about. So that was good information, I thought. I went armed to this appointment with, with all of that family information. So you were maybe thinking everything's going to be just fine. Oh, absolutely. I, I really thought... <laughs> I really thought that I um, just hadn't tried hard enough at giving up gluten or <laughs> maybe it was lactose, I don't know, whatever <laughs> it was, I hadn't tried hard enough to do or remove, um, you know, maybe someone knew I occasionally had a cappuccino, I don't know. Um, <laughs> so, so I really felt like I'd, um, that it was fine. So when I went to see the doctor, I talked to him about it and in fact he, he initially thought, uh, you know, I'm, I was 39 at the time, and he thought everything was fine also. Um, he suspected, based on what I described, something in my stomach, maybe celiacs or something else, something um, eating-related also. And the easiest way to test for that, I, I guess, is something called an endoscopy, where they look from above right. with a scope. So we scheduled that appointment, and I had an endoscopy, and it was. It was 100% normal. Um, I was fine, and, um, and uh, I remembered, though, as we were finishing that appointment, he said to me, you know, Julie, since your dad had these polyps removed, you should think about, as you're turning 40 here pretty soon, that you should have a colonoscopy. And this has turned into a little bit of a joke or you know, between my doctor and I, I said to him something effective. I thought colonoscopies were for people over 50. And he said, um, and he said, oh, Julie, don't be afraid, you know, don't be afraid. Right. He said, someday when I turn 50, or when I turn 40, when he turns 40, he was going to have to have one also. So he was younger than me. That was the first time that it happened. Um, so here I, I, I was thinking about, well, here I'm turning 40. And I guess I'll put that, file that away. But I filed it away. I didn't, um, even after my endoscopy was 100% normal, I continued to pursue the self-diagnosed path where I was, you know, I was a very strict vegetarian. Um, I definitely went certain months not eating certain foods, um, nightshades or, <laughs> or all these things that you can read about. Um, and uh, still nothing went away. But as I was paying my, my deductible for my insurance, actually, this is 100% true, I thought, well, I, I met my deductible this year. If he's serious about me wanting to, him wanting me to have that colonoscopy, I guess I'll get it done. So um, I called the office quite sheepishly, and I'll, I'll never forget this, and I said, you know, is he serious? Do I really need to do this, Bef you know? And they said, well, hold on. And, what came back and said, absolutely, he's, he's serious. So that was in maybe August, and I did what I think anyone does. I put it off as long as possible, and I uh, had an endo a colonoscopy scheduled for December 17th of 2013. Um, so prior to that, it was, um, you know, status quo. I was feeling okay, and um, there were some other symptoms that I can now identify as the uh, a cause, but but to make a long story short, um, er, that colonoscopy revealed that I in fact had advanced stage colon cancer. I want to bring up a photo here. Um, it's you on vacation. Yeah. Tell me about this photo. Why um, is it? Why is it significant? That is a picture of. Um, that's my husband. Sorry. That's your husband and somebody you went to school with. Yeah, that's my best friend, Carrie. <laughs> and you were telling me earlier that at that time, the time that was taken, you were not aware, but... Right, I, that's, this was a trip to celebrate our 40th birthday. We turned 40 within two weeks of each other. and. Um, and that's her husband, Carl. They live, uh, despite the fact that we both grew up in Oregon, uh, we're, we're Alaskans now through and through. We both moved up. Um, we both lived in Fairbanks and survived many winters. So they, um, she's my, one of my dearest friends, and to celebrate our birthdays together, we went to um, Italy. So that is in Italy. And uh, I had no idea that I had a very large tumor 
growing in my belly right there. Um, I am totally, uh, I'd been growing a tumor, they say, for about uh, 10 years. Now this next photo is also significant. This is a, a wonderful photo, but <laughs> it's with your two boys. Yep, there's Will and Jack. Jack is the one with the goofy smile. Now this uh, is, you're undergoing chemotherapy mm -hmm. at this time. Yeah, this is about uh, halfway through my chemo treatment. And, um, sorry, I've got something in my eye, really. Um, and uh, my son, the, the one with the glasses, Will, he was getting an award that night, and I wanted to um, be awake for his, his award because I had just received chemo about, I don't know, 18 hours before that, which was the hardest part to um, really stay awake for. We'll be back with our guest, Julie Wrigley, right after this break. From networking tips to ways you can jumpstart a second career, check out AARP's Work and Job Search website. Learn how to tackle tough interview questions and how to use Facebook for your job search. Visit aarp.org work. We're back with our guest, Julie Wrigley, and if I could, I want to bring up this photo that you shared yeah. with me. Mm -hmm. This is you undergoing chemo, and the, the one statement you had I thought was profound, bottom line, listen to your body, listen to yourself, and listen to your doctor. Mm -hmm. What, as you're undergoing chemo, did all of that kind of mesh for you? Is oh, absolutely. I, I think, um, I mean that because you, all of our bodies are so different and there's a lot of information in the world trying to, um, that we try to make sense of and explain for ourselves um, about what's happening to our bodies. But guidelines are just guidelines. You have to listen to your own body and you have to um, listen to yourself and that gut instinct you have that's telling you you need to pursue something or ask further questions about that. And then once you've decided to do that and, and ask questions of a medical professional that you trust, then you need to follow through on the recommendations. For every person watching this program today, what message do you want the audience to embrace? I think just that, that all of our bodies are different and only you can advocate for yourself based on um, what you're feeling and you need to communicate that to your doctor so that you can be available to your loved ones and live the life that you want to live. Now, as a business attorney, you most likely have dealt or deal with individuals who are facing life-changing situations long before you did, as mm -hmm. a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. Has this changed your perspective, what you've gone through? Well, certainly it's uh, given me an up-close look, again, at my own mortality. Um, there's nothing like um, an advanced stage disease of any kind to uh, have you think closely about uh, living your life to the fullest and paying attention to what's around you and making those tough choices and, and um, also I realized as an estate planning attorney that um, all those documents I've been helping my clients with for years are best, as they're planning documents and they're best used as a planning document where you can logically think through something when you're not in a time of crisis like cancer treatment, for instance. Right. Uh, there was a presentation I attended in fall of 2015 uh -huh. and you were a panelist and at the, uh, and during your presentation, you spoke very passionately about wanting to get the word out to every Alaskan on the documents mm -hmm. they should have. Mm -hmm. Now, speaking to Alaskans on this program, what advice do you want to share the, on the three documents people should have? Um, well, as an estate planner, I'm very passionate about planning documents. And the three documents, um, I separate them into lifetime documents and death time documents. And I'm focusing right now on the lifetime documents, which are the Ad Alaska Advanced Healthcare Directive um, and a durable power of attorney. And the third document that you mentioned is, um, fits, well, it's one of two documents, either a will or a revocable living trust. If you would, set the stage for us. Uh, let's talk about the origins 
of the Advanced Healthcare Directive. How? Yeah. Where did this start? Well, um, the Advanced Healthcare Directive in Alaska has um, this much the same origin as the document does in the rest of the country, and that is people might remember the Terry Schiavo case that happened in. Um, Florida in the mid-1990s, and the story is simply that uh, there's a lady, her name is Terry Schiavo, who was married, and she uh, had a cardiac arrest and suffered um, irreversible brain damage, effectually. And this brain damage left her um, in a, what we call, they call, a persistive vegetative state, uh, meaning there was no... Um, there was no uh, certainty that she would come out of this c coma of, of sorts. Um, I think that's maybe not the medical term, but in any case, uh, there was a disagreement between her husband at the time and her parents. Her husband maintained that it was her uh, wishes to be disconnected from life support, that she wouldn't want to receive artificial nutrition or hydration to maintain her life. Her parents, on the other hand, uh, believed the opposite. They believed that she um, did want to be maintained um, this way and that for an undetermined amount of time. So because this was in conflict, um, it was about, I think her husband filed, was it 1998, I think, to actually um, determine, uh, to, to withdraw services, to, to withdraw the life support, as it were, from her. This ensued in a long battle between um, her and her husband, and not until two, she didn't die until 2005 when finally the Florida courts, um, I think it was the Florida courts, who actually uh, gave her husband permission to do that. And so that involved even the Florida's governor and yeah George W. Bush, President Bush, um, and, weighed and in. the president yes, himself. Yes, it was it yeah. was a very big national controversy. So it went from there, the Terry Schiavo case, to the next step was the living will, and right. that basically has two questions. Yes, the Terry. So the, yes, the Terry Schiavo case led to the living will in Alaska, um, and our living will used to be a one-page document. And this one-page document had a lot of questions, but it addressed really what happens when someone is in a persistent vegetative state. And it asked simply, do you or do you not want nutrition, artificial nutrition during that? And do you or do you not want artificial hydration if you are in this persistent vegetative state? Um, that was the net effect of that document, uh, to ask those questions. And so on the books, Healthcare Decisions Act in Alaska 2004. Yes, so that living will evolved into the Healthcare Decision Act, and um, this created what the form that we have today, which is a much longer form. I think it's about, I think I have a copy. It's this copy. Um, there are six pages, I think. Um, but the most important part of this form is, um, well, is the beginning where it says simply, it asks the uh, maker of this document to designate an agent. And that's a really fabulous thing to be able to do. This document is, becomes effective when the, the um, person making it is unable to speak for themselves. So what they are doing is designating someone to speak for them only in that case. It, so a question on that is, are you required to appoint an agent then when you are putting together your advanced health care directive? Yes. In, okay. in fact, that's the main, in my mind, and I think the minds of the legislator that, legislature that passed this, this act, that's the main purpose of this. In fact, it was a, um, they removed the power of uh, an agent from another document to specifically give all health care decisions um, in one form. So this agent, um, that's their, yeah, that's their main job is to, to uh, make health care decisions on behalf of some of. And then when we're talking about a living will, are you required to appoint an agent if you have a living will? No, in fact, most living wills don't have a spot to designate an agent. Um, that's why this is preferable. When does an advanced health care directive take effect? 
Um, it takes effect. It can take effect when you have capacity, but most of the time we encourage people, we, we do encourage you to make decisions for yourself, healthcare related or otherwise, if you have the capacity to do so. So this document is, is most often only in effect when you're unable to speak for yourself. Are all medical treatments covered under an advanced health care director or, or can I specify certain types of treatment? Um, the, let's see, that's not a yes or no question. Um, <laughs> you want to use this document to talk to your agents, the agents that you're designating, um, about your preferences for medical treatments because it's hard to anticipate what medical treatments you're going to need when you're incapacitated. Right. So what I like to say about this document in particular is that it is a starting place to to talk to your loved ones or whomever, well your loved ones and or the people you are going to designate as your agent about your health care wishes mm -hmm. and, and they appreciate that. Now, can I name anyone, a relative or a non-relative, as my agent? Absolutely, absolutely. It doesn't have to be a spouse. I think I've, I've told you that um, frequently I will have, more frequently than you imagine, I have people who are not spouses of each other, or someone who is married even name someone who is not their spouse as their agent. It's really, um, sometimes the spouse doesn't want to make those tough health care decisions mm. on their loved one's behalf. Mm -hmm. it's, it's who you, uh, it's all about independence, it's all about who you want to um, nominate to make decisions in your best interest when you're unable to do that for yourself. Now as my agent, is that person financially responsible for any medical treatments that I may go through? No, they are not responsible. Now, discuss, if you would, um, what is called a list of instructions. Oh, the list of instructions. So. Um, the list of instructions is simply a list. It should not contain your signature. It's a list of people that you should call. Uh, your loved ones could call maybe the funeral home that you would prefer, um, where to find your estate planning documents, your accountant, your lawyer, things like that. But it should not contain your signature. <laughs> um, so as to, because we want to avoid it being confused for another testamentary document. So it should just be a list. A list, and in writing. In writing. And mm -hmm. uh, not, don't put it in a safety deposit box. Right, yes. I have a particular um, feeling about safe deposit box, safe, that uh, the safe deposit boxes that are in banks, um, they're really hard to retrieve things from if the key is missing and that they generally include a court order and so you can save everyone a lot of time and money by simply having a really good fireproof safe. There you go. Now I want to put up on the screen, this again is online, the, the URL for Alaska's Advanced Directives for Healthcare and Mental Health Care is quite long but it's easy to find online Yes. yes. and I do want to pull it apart and what's important about it is when you first look at it, it's overwhelming. Mm -hmm. It is overwhelming. Uh, but what's important is, as you mentioned early on uh, during our preparation for the program, there are many people who they don't complete the whole thing. Right, right. They, they may look at part one and part two. Right. Uh, it's important to note that Part one is the durable power of attorney. Part two is the specific instructions for any aspect of health care. Part three is optional, mm -hmm. and that's the, the donation. Mm -hmm. And the other very important part four is optional as well. And right, right. Never, no, one shouldn't be overwhelmed by it. You should read each page as it is. The first part, while called a durable power of attorney for healthcare decisions, it is just that, it is simply the designation of an agent, um, like it says here at the top. Um, that's the most important thing you can do right there. Um, everything else is just helpful to that person mm -hmm. um, and the other family members and uh, healthcare providers about what you actually wish. But the biggest favor you can do yourself is to actually put someone in charge of those decisions. How often should people review their paperwork? Um, you know, I say 
on a life event or or when um, something comes up that you some people just do it annually some people do it when um, somebody gets married a baby is born um, but you know every couple of years at the very least now by appearing on this program and sharing your message with Alaskans what are you hoping to accomplish by being here today um, well I think that I have two things the first one of course is related to my cancer experience and learning to listen to your body I encourage everyone to listen to their body and follow up on your intuition um, so that you can live the life that you want and as and to follow that up as an independent Alaskan as Alaskans um, like to make our own decisions the easiest way for you to continue to do that during a health care crisis is to plan ahead and and filled out one of these advanced health care directives so that everyone knows no one is guessing about what your wishes are concerning your health care. And our last slide, I've got your contact information up <laughs> if, um, and you're, you've expressed a willingness to help people so it's not overwhelming for anyone. Absolutely. Thank you. I want to thank our guest, Julie Wrigley. AARP is a nonprofit, nonpartisan member organization with more than 87,000 members in Alaska. AARP is dedicated to enhancing the quality of life for all as we age. We lead positive social change and to deliver value to our members through information, advocacy, and service. Thank you for watching AARP Alaska. Funding for this program made possible by the Investor Protection Trust, the State of Alaska Division of Banking and Securities, and AARP Alaska.